I'm James Just, and this is Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is Kalish Merrill, she's running for City Council of Hanford, and Nicholas Wildstar, who's running for Mayor of Fresno. Kalish, we're going to start with you today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you became a Libertarian and kind of your background on why you, and what brought you up to the decision on to run for City Council? I want to say that I switched parties from the Democratic Party over to Libertarian. Um, Oh boy, when was it? It was way, it was a while back. <laughs> but it wasn't until I decided to run for city council back in 2016 that I um, got involved with the party. Um, to back it up a little bit, I opened up a business in our downtown and was just really involved uh, in the community. I got on the board with our Main Street program um, and just started seeing a lot of the roadblocks that we were experiencing as businesses and whatnot. Kind of started becoming more vocal in town and uh, and before I knew it, I was running for city council. <laughs> um, but when I went to go uh, get the endorsement from our local affiliate there, that's when I, I met um, Kenneth Brent Olson, who is now our vice chair here at the, mm -hmm. the state party um, and got involved. He kind of, he kind of, He's really good at volunteering you <laughs> to do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, the volun order. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was I was already involved in so many other organizations in town. I was like, oh, Libertarian Party, like, oh, man, like, yeah, no, no, that's not it's not something I'm really gonna get into. And then I became treasurer. <laughs> and then I nice became vice know. chair, <laughs> and now I'm chair of Kings County. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's how I how I got to be involved with the party, um, uh, you know, and it just keeps on going from there. Too. Yeah, that kind of happens. Is next thing you know, I didn't even I wasn't even involved. My my better half became secretary here at the at the, at the, at the local party, mm -hmm. and then you know a year later I'm vice chair. And so, <laughs> you know, and the same thing happens. Like I recently just filed paperwork to run as a write-in candidate for my local uh, assembly yeah. district because there's no one running against the, the incumbent. And so, it, but these things just happen. You're a libertarian. Next thing you know, you're running for office. You're inviting the chair. You're on TV. You know, I was, you know, nine months ago, I had no idea that I'd be sitting here on TV or running for right. office or all these various things that now all of a sudden are routine. And so, Nicholas, why don't you want to give us your, our viewers a, a bit of your background on how you became libertarian sure. or all that kind of thing? Well, I thought if I ever been on TV, it was going to be as a superstar musician. So <laughs> <laughs> I actually moved to California from Wisconsin um, about 20 years ago uh, to pursue a career in music and, uh, you know, had my hits and misses and all of that stuff, but uh, decided to go at it alone as an independent, as an independent musician and had quite a few successes where a few of my songs were placed in movies. I had one in Scare Movie 4, um, and I was basically on the brink of the technologically uh, technological revolution. Uh, so I was one of the first musicians to have my music on Pandora and iTunes and you know Spotify, all of the streaming services before it became popular. So um, I gained some successes there as a musician and pretty much self-made. But uh, like I said, I wanted to pretty much become a musician. That's why I mu moved out here. Um, and after 9-11, my music started to take on more of a political tone. So I started to get involved in the Occupy Wall Street movement um, after being disappointed by the uh, election of Barack Obama <laughs> as a longtime Democrat, mm -hmm. you know, and seeing all of their failures, Obama just to me was the last straw, especially as a black man, you know, a month into his, uh, you know, uh, presidency, as much as he talked about, you know, we're going to get rid of Wall Street and help out the community. Next thing you know, a month in, he's bailing out the banks and, you know, getting a, a half a million dollars from Goldman Sachs. And you're like, mm -hmm. this is not the guy I, I signed up for. So <laughs> I immediately start started becoming more anti-government, so to speak. And that's why I became an anonymous activist and, you know, popped on my Guy Fox mask and uh, got out there with the Occupy Wall Street activists. But um, uh, I still saw a need for government. It was still doing things. And uh, after 9-11, of course, seeing the effects of it, um, the Patriot Act, them tracking our books that we're reading. You know, I'm going to the library 
and the books that I'm reading are being tracked by the library, you know? Uh, I remember flying before the uh, TSA and, you know, having family members greet me mm -hmm. at the gate. Now, you know, uh, it's, it's just a complete disconnect. And um, it seemed like government took over. And I, I still felt like, again, if we wanted to make those changes, we had to do it politically. And um, that's when I got involved in the Ron Paul uh, revolution <laughs> of uh, 2012, uh, because I didn't even know that he actually ran against Obama in 2008, uh, because I was so disillusioned by the two-party system, you know? So hearing his, um, him speak of libertarianism and ending the Federal Reserve, and you know, it just all just rang a bell, and I then became more politically involved and you know got involved as a candidate myself that's well that's great well let's go ahead and start moving on to some issues Kalish work i'm going to change order here a little bit mm -hmm. uh, Kalish, let's talk about economic development you've got you're in a small town and you and how is the economic development in your know, central valley because you've got the farmlands plus you know there's it's a unique environment down there and so i think maybe our viewers you know sitting here in Sacramento, we're kind of close to farmland, but it's not the same thing as you guys are down there. So maybe right. you guys can. Yeah, we've got a lot of ag there, uh, which I think is where um, uh, the natural progression was to get uh, a lot more um, uh, marijuana growers coming in. And that was a big to do because we are in um, a very conservative area, which, you know, is, is great financially, but when it comes to those social issues, mm -hmm. It was a lot of push, um, but they were able to get it through. Um, so we've got, um, oh, I've, I lost track of how many, at least a couple, I want to mm -hmm. say one or two growers that are there. And it started off with, it was just going to be medical cannabis. And that's how they were able to get the foot in the door. And, you know, uh, council conceded to that. Okay, well, it's medical, it's medical. Well, then the state laws changed. And um, uh, I think, it, oh, I think it had to do with the, um, the deliveries now mm -hmm. you know so yeah. it was like okay well, they weren't going to do dispensaries or anything like that well now we've got deliveries that can come into town well we might as well be getting the taxpayer dollars so you let's do that well. yeah. so now we've got um approvals for a couple of uh, marijuana dispensaries they'll be opening up i think one of our council members is trying to get at least like a third one you know just some of those steps but you know aside from that though uh We've got Visalia, which is right next to us. They have a very booming downtown, booming economy there. Um, meanwhile, Hanford keeps losing businesses. You know, we get a little, a little bit of growth here, but then a lot of blight here, and we just have some of the craziest zoning. Like we have protective zoning. Um, I think a while back we used to do green belting, which is what Visalia adopted from us. And then uh, we wanted to have like the mall come in back in the 90s and stuff. So instead of having a green belt, they changed over to this protective zoning to, uh, you know, certain businesses can open up outside of our downtown. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. And, you know, part of me thinks that it did help our downtown for a little while. But now that things are growing and our mall is dying, yeah. um, <laughs> We, it's time for us to release some of that zoning, um, change things up, uh, you know, and a lot of people, because, you know, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for our downtown, and um, I have, um, you know, one of my, my, my things, so if we're going to take this tool away from our downtown, let's give them a better tool. Let's do special permitting so we can get more businesses or, you know, um, renovations done on our dilapidated buildings we need to um, put moratoriums on all of our fees you know and make it a lot more business friendly to get more uh, but, business interest get out the way if nothing yes. else get out the way right if, right. if, if you're not going to help you can at least get out the way Absolutely. <laughs> you know I, mean? I think there was a song there you can't say all the lyrics on tv but. right yes you can't move. <laughs> move get out, out the, the way, way. <laughs> you know i mean this just it seems like we're in such a but you talk about conservative neighborhoods, but here in Sacramento, we're a very liberal area, but we can't even get like an economic, marijuana economic development zone in the, get, in the ghetto because they're afraid of the, of the negative element it will bring. It's like, it's a ghetto. You're not going to bring negative. <laughs> how can they get any worse? <laughs> you, know? you know, you've got homeless living on the streets. You've got, you know, people who are mm -hmm. struggling. You've got fam multiple families living in the same houses because we can't afford housing. But somehow bringing in, you know, new economic development is right. going to make the neighborhood worse, not better. It makes no sense. 
which brings me to you and your Fresno First Initiative. I was reading this thing over the All other right, day. It is it know. is it is quite a large large platform. If, <laughs> maybe you could kind of give it's us jam packed of all I would love to do. <laughs> you know? Maybe you could give us those kind of condensed version of that you know, for our viewers here. I would love to. Well, the one complaint about most. Um, people living in whatever city that you're in, I'm sure Kayla has experienced this in yourself, is that all of your tax dollars goes everywhere else. You know, whether it be another city, another state, or God knows where, you know? <laughs> so one thing I would love to do is make sure that our tax dollars are in Fresno are being kept in Fresno. Um, so especially seeing as, you know, with the development of the high-speed rail that won't ever be built and if it does ever it'll be slow as ever uh what i would like to do is actually keep our taxes our, our money and actually build a transportation system that will work uh, like a maglev system that's being used in beijing china or maybe a hyperloop that's currently being developed in other countries as well as out in the midwest uh, so if we can uh, as well as in nevada i believe so if we can, you know, entice someone like Elon Musk of, of Tesla to come here or Virgin to come here uh, in, in Fresno, build that Hyperloop or Maglev system and get people going on this, you know, state of the art transportation system, I'm pretty sure that'll create more jobs. And that'll also get the local economy booming once again, as well as revitalize the area with, you know, more industry, more businesses. And that's exactly what we want to see more so as well. Um, that's actually tied into another thing that I would like to do is get more of the financial sector of, um, of Fresno going. So what I would like to also do is develop a People's Bank of Fresno. That way we can help those businesses, those legal cannabis businesses, uh, actually put their money in the bank, you know, mm -hmm. safely and instead of having to hide it under their mattress. So um, with this People's Bank of Fresno, we have people of the community, especially those, you know, of the black and brown community that seem to be disparaged when it comes to getting loans from some of the bigger banks. They'll be able to come into the People's Bank of Fresno and get interest free loans, you know, and um, and this also be money going back to revitalize the community. Um, a part of that also what I would like to do is create our own um, public utility, which will have our own water and power department. So we won't have to rely on PG&E and what they're doing or Gavin Newsom if he decides to create a state controlled, you know, uh, utility. So we'll be independent of that. So we won't have to rely on if they shut off the power switch one day and we won't, you know, rolling blackouts. Um, so with this public utility, it will be focused on renewable energies, um, solar power, you know, hydro power, et cetera, uh, to create the um, to create the energy and, and as well as the water. What I would like to do is create these atmos atmospheric water generators, as they're called. <laughs> they're literally machines that make water out of thin air. So, um, it's like would, those Star Wars things where Luke Skywalker, you know, in the beginning of the Star Wars, out there, the moisture farm. Exactly. Yeah. You see? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they actually have this, yeah. all, this technology already. So, why are we using this to help the farmers that are experiencing the drought and, you know, growing food that we, the people, need? You know, California creates half of the nation's food supply. You know, a great majority of that comes from the Central Valley, in the Central Valley the mm -hmm. agriculture area. So, um, I definitely want to make sure we have that option and people will have this available to them. And since they're paying for it out of their tax dollars, any profits from that will go back to the people's pockets. So if we have any extra energy that we're selling off to some of these bigger businesses that need more power to run their company or, you know, um, another city or state or whatever the case may be, that money will go back into people's pockets. And essentially, everyone living there will get free power. How about that? Free power, free water. <laughs> and I want to beautify the city. Uh, I mean, as beautiful as Fresno is, uh, people would love to see more parks. Um, they attempted to pass a proposition that would have raised taxes. Uh, I believe that those parks could be built with more or less government red tape preventing those um, private businesses. Let's say, for instance, Barnes & Noble wants to come along and build a park. 
hey, I'm pretty sure the people wouldn't mind if Barnes & Noble sponsored a local park. So. Well, New York City has parks sponsored by local exactly. businesses or, or uh, philanthropists or whatever right. it is. They have parks that, that do this. And so it's not like it's a, un, un, a concept that hasn't been tried before. Exactly. It hasn't, hasn't right. worked. Right. And I'm just compiling it all into one mm -hmm. so we can see how it works to alleviate all of the problems that we're experiencing as a community, whether it be... Um, you know, the rolling blackouts uh, that from PG&E or the water shortages or even um, the food sh shortages. You know, we unfortunately have families that go hungry, even though we have tons of food. So um, I would also like to see more community gardens be built, more sidewalk gardens be built where if you're walking down a residential neighborhood, you know, you have uh, fruits and vegetables growing right there. On the sidewalk. Well, I know in some neighborhoods, it's actually illegal to plant fruits and vegetables in it your front is. yard. And exactly. You can plant them in your backyard, but you can't plant them in, right. plant them in your front yard because yeah. it's going to hurt the property value of your next door neighbor That's or something. That's ridiculous. And I was like, when is the when is resale value actually the chief actual property value? You know, mm -hmm. it's right. it's part of property value. It's not the full rate of property value. Right. Use value. You know, my I live in the in the house my grandfather built, and he passed it on to the generations, and you know, hopefully, I get to pass it on to future generations, to my grandchildren. And you know, like I pass it on to me, I get to pass it on to my grandchildren. And that's what, that's what um, the American dream used to be, mm -hmm. right? You didn't buy a house so you could sell it and move to, move to uh, what, Florida or Arizona and live like a king, right? You, you bought the house so, and so you could pass it on for future generations. Exactly. So they had a, an economic floor that they could not, would have it difficult to fall behind. It's not that you can't fall below the floor, but it becomes more difficult to fall below the floor. You can, when I was almost homeless in, in uh, San Diego, uh, Chula Vista technically, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I my family rescued me, came back. I had a place to go. Mm -hmm. I had a place in my family. It's like we all to rebuild my life, and so now I'm back here. And so that, so that kind of economic development is actually needed. And we also need to stop preventing people. Mm -hmm. But that actually brings me back to the homeless question. And I apologize for me being moving my head here. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's go back to the homeless. Homeless is an issue of. Uh, Intense complexity. So, how do we find the short and long term, term <laughs> solutions? There are short term solutions, right? Because we have to get people off the streets. But the, the actual solution is more long term, right? How do we prevent housing costs and cost of living from getting out? So, is right. there anything, you know, and each Fresno and Hanford are going to have different solutions. So, what right. about Hanford? What? So, Hanford, I know that we had a, um, um, like a coalition of different organizations that were coming together. So we had uh, ones that were addressing mental health and other ones that were providing, um, you know, a home for people struggling with dependency and um, you know, drug abuse issues and whatnot. Um, so a bunch of these different organizations were, have been really great. They, they came together, uh, created that, that co-op kind of thing. Um, recently, the city has now taken it upon themselves to become the facilitator for that co-op. So they. From what I can tell, they've kind of disbanded doing it privately and have now joined forces with the city. Um, and it just kind of makes me wonder just how much the city is actually going to be able to do, you know, or how much it's going to cost us. I, I was looking through some of the minutes recently and, you know, I, I maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but I want to say that I saw something where like a plan was going to be put in place and it was going to cost $30,000 for a plan. You know, maybe there's, I didn't go to the meeting, there might be more things to the $30,000, but from what I'm reading just on black and white, it looks like just a plan. And you know, that's what we see, like just this hyperinflation of costs when it comes to government stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think like, you know, if we were, if it worked a little bit more about, uh, more like where there was that co-op, but we have government liaisons coming in to be that facilitator when there's, you know, a, you know, need some sort of permission from government or whatever. Yeah, when you to, need some kind of service, there's some kind of conflict, you need some kind of service from the government, you, you, you know, it happens. Yeah, or, you know, we, we need this property for whatever, you know, what do you know about this? What what do we need to do to acquire this property? Who owns it? Or, or yeah. getting the zoning change where we can do this? You know, it, sometimes things like yeah. that, you know, it speeds it up when you have like a government mm -hmm. liaison there. Um, but then, you know, but the, like the long term though, it's definitely going to be reducing all those regulations. I think uh, LA, LA is a great case where there was a guy, I remember he built a bunch of like just tiny little sheds mm -hmm. for people's to go and live in. And it was helping out the homeless. It was, he was just doing out of the goodness of his heart. Right. LA came in and repossessed 
And find them. (laughs) 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 So, did that, you know, then you got the homeless, they were just like, what's up, man? Like, my stuff, like, it was all in there, it was safe, I was able to get clean, I was able to go to interviews, and you just screwed me over again. Exactly. And now the city's going, okay, well, now we've got this issue, let us address it. Right. Well, their own regulations got in the way of them. It was taking too long for them to build the housing because their own regulations are so burdensome uh, that they finally had to go and do like an emergency rezoning or fix their ordinance or whatever to allow themselves to build homeless shelters. (laughs) I think I read somewhere in LA, just just LA is spending a billion dollars a year on homelessness. Mm -hmm. Just LA. And I actually was reading something about what we now call the, the homelessness industrial complex. It's, you know, we talk, Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex, but if you actually look across the government landscape, there's all these industrial complexes that mm-hmm. all exist all over the place. The educational industrial yes. complex, the, the police industrial complex, the, the, healthcare. the, the healthcare industrial yes. complex, okay. and the homeless industrial complex is the latest Absolutely. one. Um, it's a big problem up in Seattle, and it's a growing problem here in, in Sacramento. How are you going to prevent that kind of thing in Fresno? Well, one of the first things I would like to do is actually build homes. <laughs> the right. one thing government, you know, refuses to do is, despite them being delegated these millions of dollars, you know, in government funding uh, or grants or whatever the case may be, they don't build homes. Uh, so I would like to take some of the underdeveloped land in Fresno and actually build what are called 3D printed homes. Um, You can Google them. Uh, (laughs) uh, But yeah, these 3D printed homes uh, can be built in less than 24 hours for less than $5,000 each. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we just took a small area, built 100 of these homes and immediately housed um, those people, families that are out on the street that maybe have small children or um, dealing with some mental health issue that needs immediate attention, or you know our military veterans or young people even uh, uh, believe it or not the majority of the homeless community um, has a great population of teenagers mm-hmm. you know so we need to help those teenagers get off the street and for wherever for whatever reason they're being denied entry into these programs that would help them get housing and that's another issue like Kayla's brought up is government has created all of these programs that are too burdensome. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes too long to go through the qualification process for them to get it, that help. So, of course, eliminating all of those provisions to expedite things would be best, of course. Um, and another thing I would like to do is um, create a mental health response team to actually go out there and um, provide care for those people that do have mental health issues instead of sending out police and you know wasting taxpayers dollars on throwing those people in jail yeah for i've always said that we've got um three different uh, three main types of homeless problems we've got the the long-term homeless like i've had a guy who i've been giving my recycling to for the over a decade and um, every every couple of weeks he comes in he picks up all my recycling and he likes being he essentially I don't know, likes being homeless it's probably the wrong word he doesn't fit into normal society in the mm-hmm. base past he would have been a mountain man he would have been mm-hmm. you know a trapper that kind of thing he doesn't fit in society anymore and so he's a perfectly great guy you, but you wouldn't want to you know he doesn't fit in society mm-hmm. so you've got that kind of homeless and how do you deal with that and that's one problem and then you've got the transitional homeless people who have for whatever reason they've lost a job or that you don't have family, you don't have a family safety net when you to take care when they have an issue mm-hmm. with rent. And so they're homeless for a you know a short period of time, a month or two, while they get their self. You know, they're still working, they're still a functional human being, but they're not able to get back onto this track. It's hard. Once you get once you get to nothing, it's hard to get back to one, right? Mm-hmm. It's getting that going is the hardest part. And then you've got the, the other kind of homeless is the drug addict and the person who have gotten there from their own bad choices. And so we have to deal with these three things as three, as three distinct tools. We have, we've got three distinct problems, so we have to have three distinct tools to deal with them. And you've got the short-term solutions, so let's get some houses, let's get these people off the streets, or, or if nothing else, let's get some bathrooms to use, some place to clean up, mm-hmm. right? If you're not going to have them a place to a place to sleep, let's leave them a place where they can go to the bathroom and clean up. Right. And right. some basic sanitation, please. Yeah. You know, if nothing else, if, yeah. you know, some basic but humanities. But that short-term <laughs> solution is the long-term solution because that's really all they're looking for is to get off of the street. You know, like you said, you have those certain group of people that, you know, are choosing to be on the streets and that's fine. Vagrancy shouldn't be a crime. But that's how we're 
that's how we're doing it right now. Yeah, but know? that that percentage is actually fairly low. If it exactly. was just the if it was just those the kind of the mountain man person right. who doesn't mm -hmm. want to, that's just so low. We, we right. actually doesn't really worry. And about I'm pretty it. sure if you gave them the facilities like adequate public bathrooms to use, and you know. Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't see them, you know, living on the actual sidewalk. Actually, those people are actually some of the most civil homeless people I know. They they, they don't aggravate anybody. You know, they, they ask you for for change, but they don't do it in an aggressive manner. Right. It, it's it's the it's kind of the other groups that kind of get aggressive because they're desperate. Exactly. Whether they're desperate for drugs or desperate for mental ill or desperate just to get them their family off the street or fed, right. they're desperate. And when people do are desperate, they do desperate things. Exactly. And, the other group of people, they're not desperate. They're kind of living the life they've chosen to live, even though they don't necessarily like it. And so, you know, they prefer to be a, a mountain, you know, a mountain man or a right. trapper in the old days. But Traveler. but society yeah. nowadays right. is too yeah. complex, okay, right? And so, <laughs> all right, we've got a few minutes left. Let's go back to your. We were talking, I think, the last show a little bit about charter cities. Mm -hmm. And Sacramento is a charter city, and it gives right. us a little bit of protection. We get like we get to have SMUD. We get to have our own uh, public utility, so we mm -hmm. get cheaper uh, electric rates. And we have some protections from some of the stuff that uh, Sacramento does over our water, even though we ended up getting forced to have water meters when we didn't used to. We, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a, you know obviously not perfect, but at least it gives you a little bit of pushback when it comes to Sacramento, uh, a little bit more say in what your tax dollars are paying for or being able to keep some of your tax dollars within your city. Um, uh, like, so Needles, California is a great example of them really using their charter uh, to the full extent where they became a Second Amendment city, uh, sanctuary city. Uh, they were just finding that, you know, their, their argument was they're so close to the Nevada border and you got so many people with, you know, access to so many guns. Well, mm -hmm. let our people protect themselves with their own guns. So, you know, that's how they were able to kind of push that through and, um, you know, get the, the city officials to agree to that. Um, so, but um, yeah, there's still different ways to, that you can go about having a, yeah. having a little bit more autonomy. Well, <laughs> it, the sanctuary cities thing is kind of interesting here. The Democrats here in California love sanctuary cities when mm -hmm. they were, when they were for illegal aliens, which is fine. I have no problems with sanctuary cities for illegals. But then when it's sanctuary cities for the Second Amendment, it's somehow a massive, we can't do that. It's, <laughs> we don't have the authority to do that. Correct. It's like, well, right. you, the cities have the authority to do these kind of things, or they, they don't, yeah. right? And that was like the interesting thing. It was like, well, if you're going to do a sanctuary city, we're going to do a sanctuary city. We're yeah, going to <laughs> mix the, it up. The plan has to kind of work for both, for both for everybody, right? Exactly. If, if you're picking and choosing when you get to apply your morality, then it's not really a morality. Yeah. It's just right. your feelings. And we're running, that's about all the time we have today. I'd like to thank our guests for appearing and for coming so far. Join us next week where we can finish our discussion. Um, Nicholas, your website is? Wildstar2020.com. And you can be found on Facebook? Facebook, yeah. Cleesh Morrow for Hanford City Council. And for information about this, you can go to libertariancounterpoint.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, please press all the buttons. We greatly appreciate it. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, we thank you for watching and please remember to love everybody.